let me say a word in defense of reason in dialogue with faith. Because faith is that proof. Faith unites us to that substance. But reason, in order to realize its full potential, needs the horizons revealed by and truths contained in the faith. And not just any faith, but the Catholic faith. These elaborate introductions always make me feel inclined to say, if I'm that good, why ain't I rich? <laughs> Uh, I, I'm very glad to be here, and thank you very much for inviting me. Um, and I also apologize, uh, one or two things I shall say that, that now, I, I said to a small group of people who Dr. Weir got me to talk to about Plotinus and Christian thought in antiquity this afternoon, I'd forgotten what I was going to say this evening, I said one or two things, but not very much. So I apologize to those who were here a little bit twice. <coughs> there are many very great writers men and women without whose work our cultural, intellectual and spiritual inheritance will be notably diminished. Among them, everyone will have his personal top ten. But I myself have a special devotion to four of them, one of whom may be corporate as well as personal. One of them is English, obviously Shakespeare, the great crypto-Catholic writer living through the only period in English history adorned by the presence of a secret police force. Of the others, two are Greek, namely Homer and Plato. And it's Plato who is my subject tonight at popular request. But which Plato? The historical people of Socrates, insofar as we can come to grips with him through the wealth of later and continuing interpretations and misinterpretations, for every commentator is an interpreter. The inspiration for the revived Platonism of Plotinus in the third century of our era, of the man in whom Augustine claimed that Plato had come back to life, the man whose basic principles helped deliver Augustine himself from materialism, or are we to look for the inspirer of Petrarch and of Marsilio Ficino's Florentine Academy, or of the anti-Calvinism of the 17th century Cambridge Platonists, or for the man whom Whitehead described as a philosopher of such power that all subsequent Western philosophy is a footnote to his work. Or, or, the, or perhaps, as Iris Murdoch thought, the man who could rescue metaphysics <coughs> without the failed barbarism of Christian theology. And these are only some of the varying Plato's and Platonisms one could list in the plus column. And there's also a minus column too. The Platonism of the fin de siècle decadence like Swinburne <coughs> and the splendidly witty if morally dodgy Oscar Wilde. A Platonism, close scare quotes, to which I have learnt from the misfortunes of another lecturer to be careful of how I speak of, lest I be misinterpreted. For once in Toronto, an overweight and over-opinionated visiting professor of English one of the so-called God professors of the day from the more officially authoritarian times of the academic world, started his oration with the following immortal words, I am not a practicing Platonist, which met with the immediate response from the back of the room, you'd be in jail if you were, <laughs> so I could stop there. What I've already said indicates something of the perennial importance of Plato. Oh, and I forgot. Uh, he fascinated Aristotle too, the thinker whom he apparently dubbed the mind of the school. Though Plato's academy wasn't really a school in the ancient sense of the word, but a place where people could think together, where it didn't matter whether you accepted Plato's views or not. All of its leading members, Aristotle, Plato's nephew and successor Speusippus, the mathematician and moral philosopher Eudoxus, mentioned in the Alchemic in Ethics, of course, Book 10, and many another publicly disagreed with Plato on substantive issues, but none of them left the academy during the master's lifetime. The perennial importance of Plato, that is, had already been established when he died in 347 BC. What then was the role of Plato in the academy? Why did he found the academy? What did he want people to do there? Answers to these questions will bring us closer to the wide-ranging nature of Plato's philosophical activity. And when we grasp something of that, 
we can begin to understand why there are so many Platonisms and to direct our attention to the more basic question of how Plato supposed one could become a philosopher and why it was, as Socrates had already proclaimed in his trial, subhuman not to philosophize. Let us start then with the foundation of the academy, then turn to Plato's philosophical behavior as its founder. In commenting on these questions for the point of view of the professionals, I shall assume that the so-called seventh letter is genuine, but even if it isn't, the story it tells of the more public aspects of Plato's career is largely accurate. He himself was an aristocrat from a family deeply involved on both sides of the political spectrum. The Democrats, though the word indicates something of people's democracies as well as of our normal Western version, and the oligarchs, the neoconservatives, eager to, to replace the democracy by what they considered a more rational form of government. For the ex-democrat Alcibiades had adopted their tone when he described democracy as then understood as acknowledged folly. At the end of the Peloponnesian War, members of the oligarchic group, led by Plato's own uncle, Critias, invited Plato to join the government established in Athens with foreign support. Plato decided to wait and see how they behaved, doubtless from personal experience fearing the worst, and was appalled as they launched a campaign of confiscations and murders, which had they not been overthrown, would have included the killing of Socrates himself. For Socrates had disobeyed an order to take part in the arrest of a fellow citizen, selected for elimination for the sake of his money. Socrates' behaviour, as Plato records it, was a paradigm case of what's now called agent relative morality. He knew that his refusing to take part in the arrest would not save the life of the victim. His attitude was, injustice will be committed. I cannot prevent it but it will not be committed through me. So he went back home, expecting the knock on the door, no doubt, at three o'clock in the morning. Before that could happen, however, democracy, so-called, was restored again. And again, Plato was invited to take a leading role. But then followed the judicial murder of Socrates himself for, quote, atheism and corrupting the youth, which confirmed Plato's belief that politics, as then practiced, and not only in Athens, could not be redeemed and that one must start again by educating a new breed of political figures, the guardians of the Republic, whose policies were to aim at the good of the subjects, not the advantage, financial or sexual, of the rulers. It's worth noting in this connection that in the ancient world, so far as the evidence reveals, Power-hungry politicians loved, re rarely loved power for its own sake, that is, for the sheer satisfaction of being backstage controllers of events, like Martin Bormann and the Hitler regime. Rather, they lusted for money, land, and uncontrolled access to the bodies of women and boys, often preferably spiced with the satisfaction of imposing humiliation on the families and friends of those abused. To put a break on all that, Plato founded his academy, where intelligent young men and the few women who dared to join were to learn better. But how do we know in a world in which increasingly the sophisticates or pseudo-sophisticates are coming to believe in some form of Protagoras' claim that man is the measure of all things, what is good or better anyway? That question led Plato to construct the first metaphysical defense of morals an attempt to show that ethics is at best a conventional code, at worst a confidence trick, if it lacks foundations. In our day, when many see rules or heart or royalty, not to speak of Derrida or Nietzsche, as near divine figures, we can hardly fail to see the importance of the philosophical project that Plato had begun to undertake. The founding of the Academy then, however it was to develop, was in the first instance a practical project. So we can now turn to personal role, Plato's personal role in that project. This can best be approached in light of an extraordinary situation which developed toward the end of Plato's life when he wrote the work called Timaeus. 
a work of a type which in his earlier days he claimed he was incapable even of attempting, namely to offer an, an account of the principles by which our universe has been constructed by God. As soon as the Timaeus was complete, arguments broke out in the academy as to whether Plato was describing the formation of the universe with time, that's Aristotle's interpretation, or whether the apparently temporal references indicated a strictly metaphysical and atemporal dependence of the universe on God and goodness, the view of the other leading member, Xenocrates. The Timaeus was written several years before Plato's death, when Aristotle and Xenocrates were in daily contact with its author. We can only assume that when they asked him what he intended, he gave an enigmatic answer, like, yes, that's the problem. I have myself received a similarly disconcerting response from a prominent Catholic aficionada of Wittgenstein. The point is, of course, that Plato wanted his friends to work out the answer for themselves. He had set up the problem and perhaps pointed toward the right answer, but he wasn't going to spoon-feed the questioners. More generally, Plato did not answer, so far as we know, the question, how do we save the appearances? That is, the supposedly necessary regularity of the apparently erratic motions of the heavenly bodies, but asked his scientific and his mathematical friends what they might suggest. Which brings us via a late dialogue to the original nature and purpose of the dialogue form, and to the question, why are the vast majority of Plato's philosophical works dialogues, not treatises, not oracular poems like that of Parmenides? The question is best approached by scrutinising a few features of both the form and the procedures of a few dialogues. Noting first, however, that most Platonists in the past seem to have taken no notice of the form in which Plato wrote, thus in no small measure generating the varying and often conflicting forms of philosophy, more or less acceptable to Plato himself, which appear in the secondary literature as Platonisms. Here there's an example from the early dialogue Lackeys. At one point in the search for an account of the virtue of courage, Nikias says that he has heard that it's to do with a knowledge of good and evil. A Socratic answer, it would seem, and we might expect it to be found acceptable. Yet when Socrates examines it and reveals Nikias unable to defend what he has heard, his explanation of courage is discarded revealing that it's not enough to know, in quotes, or to have heard the right answer, but must also be able to justify it. Consider a modern parallel. In a philosophy class, it's not enough to know that there are human rights, merely telling the instructor, for example, that the UN has said they exist. One must be able to defend them, especially in a godless world, that is, against Bentham's reasonable complaint in such a world that they are, as he put it himself, nonsense on stilts, those quotes. Here's another and better known example of Plato's procedures, this time from the Republic. Thrasymachus, who asserts that what the weak and stupid call justice is in fact the advantage of the stronger. But he knows he's lost the argument with Socrates. But Plato points, paints him as uncomfortable and assures us that he has some excuse for being so when he presents his own brothers, that is Glaucon and Adimantus, restating Thrasymachus' argument in what they take to be a more accurate, more pragmatic and more emotionally challenging form. So Plato is telling us that Thrasymachus has been defeated at least in part because he cannot understand how he has been led necessar unnecessarily into error. Thrasymachus, characterised and victimised by his own ideas, is the kind of person who cannot understand arguments, whether good or bad. He suffers from something like invincible ignorance. Plato thus showing that unless you're a certain kind of person, you may be unable to grasp the truth when it's set before your eyes. Aristotle, incidentally, offers the same opinion in his Ethics. Unless one has been brought up in the right way, one may be unable, as an adult, to see the truth. A blind man cannot see. A distorted, or in Anscombe's language, a corrupt mind, cannot understand. Such distortion frequently deriving from an inadequate pre-philosophical education. 
So we can recognize that the dialogue form enables Plato both to point toward the correct solution of a philosophical problem and to emphasize the success in philosophy as distinct, that is, from the showy fame of an airport professor or its ancient equivalent, I'll come back to that, can it be separated from one's prior moral and hence intellectual condition? That dual platonic intent has not been understood by most Platonists in the course of the last couple of millennia, but it's a very important part of his legacy, which we are now learning to retrieve. And there's a second aspect which we can also retrieve. Standing near the beginning of Western philosophical inquiry, Plato had to learn as he went along. I've already indicated how with time he came to recognize that to defend morality against the cynics and nihilists, he needed to propose the metaphysics of morals. That is, he learned that it was necessary to do that. Indeed, Plato knew well that all serious thinking must be subject to revision, that truth, so far as we have discovered it, is what constantly survives the challenge, perhaps preferably the hostile challenge. I often advise students when they've written an essay, show it to somebody who hates your guts and see what he thinks. If you can correct it then, you may have written a good essay. Certainly when Plato had put the finishing touches to his masterwork, The Republic, he might have supposed that his philosophical journey was substantially over. But he soon realized that his proposals were neither complete nor clearly enough expressed for serious critics to find them compelling. Plato had already radically revised his philosophical psychology since he wrote the Phaedo, abandoning the more simplistic claim that moral evils derive from a battle between soul and the urgent desires of the body, in favor of a recognition that the soul too, in all of us until philosophically corrected, is morally weak and easily corrupted. We can have a weakness for booze, for example, and develop the habit of drinking to excess, develop the habit of drinking to excess. We can either follow the erotic passion of our better selves in love of the good and of acts in accordance with it, or at worst, sink into a Humean morass where we assume or learn that the mind is and ought only to be the slave of the passions. After completing the Republic, and with a new so-called tripartite psychology in place, Plato realized the need for still further philosophical reconsiderations. How many intelligible forms are there? How can we adequately explain the ontological relationship between forms and particulars? In what sense are, are forms self-predicating? In which cases of one over many should we recognize the presence of a form at all? In all that, we see a recognition of the need for self-criticism, comparable to, and in many ways more radical than, that proposed by Kant in his post humean period and by Wittgenstein when he concluded that the Tractatus was fundamentally flawed. So we can learn from Plato not only to construct arguments tailored to the capacity of our hearers, so as to show them the inadequacy of their characters as well as the low quality of their arguments, but have the humility to avow that we've been seriously in error, either in our philosophical claims, or in our presentation of them, or in both of the above. Humility is a virtue rare among philosophers, who whether or not from mere fear of loss of reputation, of a bella figura, as the Italians would put it, are often tempted, as Augustine was already to point out, to try indefensible moves, or subtly to change the subject so as to avoid admitting that in their thinking they've hit a brick wall. If there are perhaps no limits to philosophy, Plato helps show the necessity of recognizing the limitations of what we ourselves have achieved as yet philosophically. Especially in his earlier writings, when he's much concerned to present Socrates' interlocutors in a context where both their philosophical and moral virtues and vices can be readily displayed, Plato, a genius in the richness of his language and syntax, the man who, according to the Greeks, quote, knew Homer best, close quote, goes to great lengths to offer literary masterpieces as well as material to make the reader or listener think. For remember the stupendous social implications of the task Plato is attempting. He has decided that Greek education, based on a reading of Homer and the ancient poets, is now incapable of supporting a civilized Greek culture. 
with the coming of the sophists and their relentless questioning, it's impossible to go back to the primitive days. Were they the city of pigs, as he says allegedly in the Republic, or the good old days, as Aristophanes would have put it, of those who fought at Marathon, where perhaps in blissful ignorance of basic doubt, we could at least hope to be able to obey our native sense of right and wrong. Now, in Plato's view, if we were to counter the threat of intellectual and therefore moral collapse, the entire system of education must be reformed and re-established on properly constructed intellectual foundations. Otherwise, we shall not be able to resist the challenges depicted, whether critically or not, by tragic and comic poets and historians in ancient Greece, as well as by philosophers. By people who said stuff like, well, if Zeus is a serial adulterer, why shouldn't I, a mere mortal, follow his exciting example? Or, what precisely is wrong with beating my mother and father? Or, what you call self-control, isn't it really just a lack of virility? Or, in Euripides' summation, what's wrong, lest the audience suppose it to be so? To resist all that, and that's, those are all non-Platonic examples, to resist all that, a new philosophical education must, be, must re-establish, even replace the old. But to do that, it must be presented in a beautiful literary form, able to enchant, as do the poems of Homer. A splendid and perennial protest of Plato's against the banal jargon and cliché-littered prose in which most Anglo-American philosophy is thrown together. For as Evelyn War once observed, quote, in English, it's now impossible to avoid clichés, but at least you don't have to build up to them. <laughs> Plato's lady philosophy in the Republic, like Penelope in the Odyssey, deserves worthy suitors. If she succumbs to banal writers of a banal language, she can never be the muse of goodness, and at worst becomes the procurus of change to the trivial or worse. So to pull things together thus far, we need fine ideas presented in fine language and tailored to the capacity of the would-be thinker, which insofar as we decline to be subhuman, means all of us. But how do we comport ourselves when confronted with clever, populist and intimidating philosophical bullies, always ready to pull rank and fame, if not notoriety? Plato shows us that too. Return once more to Socrates and Thrasymachus, and if I had time, I could add Callicles in the Gorgias. From the start of the debate, Thrasymachus reveals himself as fiercely contemptuous of what he sees as mere bourgeois goodness. Plato, too, incidentally in his way, and without the violent bluster, is similarly critical of such apparent virtue. In the Phaedo, Socrates observes only half tongue in cheek that conventionally decent people are like social insects, bees or ants and will be reborn as such in the next time round. Why so? Because Plato well knows that under those pressures of what all Greek philosophers re recognise as the enemy of the just and honest life, namely pleasure and pain, they will abandon their principles to save their skins or taste the dolce vita. But Socrates, master of pleasure in the symposium and of pain in the Phaedo, also knows how to handle fashionable intellectual thugs. Oh, oh, Thrasymachus, you think I'm a deluded idiot when I talk about justice. Perhaps you're right. Perhaps I am. But please indulge me to the point of giving me an argument from which I can learn better. A response such as in the Mino brings down on his head the warning of Anitus, the politician, of course, most responsible for his eventual death, as the readers of the Mino well know, that he better watch his back, as it says in the Mino, in this city, close quotes. I've commented briefly on why Plato determined to write neither poems nor treatises but literary dialogues, but I too am a mere commentator. And as I said, all commentators perforce are interpreters. And my attitude to the questions I have raised, as I've indicated, differs substantially from most ancient, medieval and even more modern Platonists. Why is that so? Can I explain why until recently Platonists have regularly neglected the dialogue form which I have argued enriches both Plato's work and our ability to appreciate it. I think I can offer a good explanation, and that very explanation points to further aspects of the perennial importance of Plato. For so far, I've talked about the form of Plato's proceedings, 
about how he tried to make his readers think philosophically, not merely to recount data about the views of some philosophers, even about Plato himself, that is. For as Gilbert Ryle once embarrassingly pointed out in France, incidentally, in some countries, he said, everyone can talk about philosophy. There just aren't any philosophers. The basis of my explanation is that most of Plato's readers, from Aristotle, who was thought of as a deviant Platonist through most, if not all, of his life, down through those who called themselves Platonists, not middle Platonists or near Platonists in antiquity, to all other Platonists or Platonizers in the story of the history of Western philosophy. All these were so impressed by at least parts of the content of Plato's thought, the quote system they thought they found in Plato's writings, that they concentrated entirely on attacking, amending, updating or defending that content, concerning themselves have unfortunately little with Plato's ongoing discoveries or his reasons for embarking on the quest in the first place. So leaving aside what I see as the incomplete understanding of the demands of a fully full-blooded full Platonism, I want now to consider at least a few of the major principles underlying and forming that so valued content. Having then glanced at what Plato wanted to reject and why he wanted to reject it, and the means he chose by which to reject it, I'll proceed to the key features of what he wanted to promote and defend against all comers. I repeat, against all comers, in our time, as in his own. Plato was the first Western philosopher to argue unambiguously for the existence of an immaterial world. A world, that is, of what he called forms or ideas, plus the minds, human and divine, capable of apprehending them. As one would expect, of course, the claim didn't come out of the blue. Parmenides, in particular, had done some of the preliminary philosophical spade work by arguing for a changeless being that seemed to possess both immaterial and material qualities, to be discussed in terms of a subject with material and immaterial predicates. But because of that ambiguity, we cannot be certain whether he clearly identified non-physical objects, or whether he merely claimed that the universe is a single substance, such as just to allow what we would think of as both material and immaterial qualities. I believe this is now sometimes referred to as a dual aspect theory. What adds plausibility to that is that when we talk about ancient materialism, we should not think of the post-Cartesian variety. There are no Cartesian materials in the ancient world. Often the term vitalism would suit ancient theories a good deal better than materialism. Be that as it may, there's no doubt that against Parmenides, Plato proposed the existence of two realms. I hesitate to refer to two worlds because that sort of talk is often seriously misinterpreted the immaterial world recognized by the mind, and the material world recognized by the senses. But this is not, of course, strictly a two-world theory, because ontologically, the sensible world depends on the existence of the intelligible, which left Plato with the problem he tried in various ways to tackle for the rest of his life, namely, in what way that dependence can be explained. This was a major discovery though with hindsight it might misleadingly seem the mere recognition of an obvious fact. So we need to ask how Plato came to discover it, as well as why he thought it so important that if he was wrong about it, the error would not be just an academic or philosophical failure, but would entail disastrous moral, social and political consequences. For as you'll, as you'll realize from what I've already said, Plato came to his discovery came about as a result of his efforts to save the possibility of morality. As we have seen, Plato thought that the coming of sophistic questioning, traditional social, of, of traditional social values, and any traditional account of social justice, justice, courage, self-control, all that would be inadequate. We would have lost our moral virginity, and like physical virginity, that's hard to recover. Moral words would lose any fixed sense and could be reinterpreted to suit the partisan, even criminal interests of political or military groups. So Platonic forms were originally formed of moral and relatedly mathematical objects. Thus typically the argument would run, if A, B, C are F, there's a form of Fness. So that if A, B, C are just, act, just acts, there's a form of justice, by which the justice of the particular just act can be identified and measured. Justice itself can only be recognized by the mind, and strictly speaking, strictly speaking, only justice is somehow just. 
while just acts or just agents partake in various degrees in the form of justice. Were there no form of justice, we should not be able to defend any sort of that just act as just. Any behaviour could be labelled just, as Thrasymachus proclaimed and as Plato well recognised. While the implications of such claims are already being cynically advanced by politicians, Uncle Critias had been good at that, to justify brutal and lustful behaviour. Remember, of course, we're not talking about armchair stuff here. In ancient Greece, if your citizens lost a war, the men might be killed, the women gang raped and then enslaved. In Plato's view, unless moral terms could be fixed by reference to his forms, there could only be prudential arguments against that sort of behaviour. Justice is just, which seems odd. But the oddness becomes a bit more intelligible if we consider not justice, but the quality which Plato probably first proclaimed to refer to a form, namely beauty, tokalon. To use a very inadequate translation for the word which indicated the highest kind of moral, mathematical and aesthetic excellence. In Greek you can talk, as in English, of being good at or good for, as well as being just good. Thus, you could be good at assassinating people. And this is often pointed out by Greek writers. But there's no similar possibility with the word beautiful in Greek. That indicates an absolute quality, something beautiful in itself. In the symposium, beauty is the only form discussed, and it's the first introduced in the Republic. As I said, it was probably the first moral aesthetic form to which Plato attended closely. And that connects with what I identified as his first philosophical discovery with his second. The first, you remember, is the discovery of the immaterial or incorporeal. The second relates to the human power which Plato believes can bridge the gap between the material and the immaterial worlds. That power to philosophize, which is best understood with reference to the form of beauty. This needs spilling out in more detail, with particular reference to the symposium. Because although the symposium, as the ancients understood more often than most of the modern commentators, was not Plato's last and most accurate word on love, it is, however, the, own, the single dialogue wholly devoted to that theme. And I would assert re without reservation that if a reader fails to understand much of the symposium, he can only look at Plato's work as an outsider. He cannot understand what it is to be a Platonist. Plato and Socrates, the latter of course the hero of the former in the symposium, were both religious men. Though Socrates' religion, not limited to what we would call civil religion, was one of the excuses for killing him as an atheist. While Plato, already the, always the enemy of relativism, with the thesis that man is the measure of all things, emphasizes regularly, and most specifically in his last work, The Laws, that God is the measure of all things, just as in the Timaeus, he is the former of all things, quote, because he wants to and because he is good, close quotes. Thus, understanding the forms, the immaterial world, is also bringing the human soul into closer contact with a cleaned up concept of God, the lover of goodness and beauty, and whose love of such must result in the generation, as far as possible, of everything properly labelled good and beautiful. From reflection on the single form of the symposium, we learn that Socrates, the passionate, erotic lover of truth, goodness and beauty, becomes characterised by what he loves or longs for, and when so characterised, must be philosophically creative. When, according to Socrates' instructor, the priestess Diotima in the symposium, I don't want to spend time now on why the instructress is female, though it does matter, the philosopher is impelled by Eros towards beauty itself and eventually catches a glimpse of it. He or she then becomes a generator or begetter in the beautiful, what Plato calls a tokos en kalo, generation in the beautiful. What does he mean by that? Quite simply that beauty is inspirational. That's why the form beauty must itself be beautiful, so beautiful as to be able to do what nothing else can. That is, inspire a man or woman with such strength of purpose as to seek to know and live with the beauty of truth and spread the word about it to other people. So the discovery of the relationship between love, beauty, creativity and inspiration is Plato's second great gift to those who read and think about his work. And from that day to this, all genuine Platonists, from Plotinus to my own humble self, want to count ourselves as lovers of truth, 
and hence desirous of showing the beauty of truth to other people. To understand that this all makes a certain sense, consider the following test. Suppose you see a beautiful picture. Unless you're a miserable art collector who wants to turn public goods into private possessions, or who thinks the picture owns a source of cash on the open market, you'll say to yourself something like, that's beautiful, I want my family and my friends to see it too. And I know that far from their pleasure and inspiration in seeing it diminishing my own, rather it will increase it. Incidentally, texts saying things very like that can be found in the greatest Christian Platonist, Samuel Augustine, especially, but certainly not only, in his work on the freedom of the will, free choice. And here's a second case. If I say that I love someone, and he or she then asks me to help her, and I say no, then I'm convicted of not loving at all. Loving entails acting in accordance with reference to what you love. Hence in the Republic, when Glaucon asks Socrates why he makes the guardians return to the cave, that is, re-enter the world of social and practical life, what Augustine called this darkness of social life, as quotes, Socrates dismisses the objection out of hand with the cursory reply, they are just men, therefore they will do what they ought. To be a guardian, a philosopher, entails not only to know the good, but to love it. Knowing without loving is not real knowing, rather at best it's knowing about. Thus I might know something about the form of the good by reading a platonic dialogue. But I only know goodness when I've, quote, seen it and want to act in accordance with it. That seeing cannot really be explained. Knowledge is not entirely propositional, of course, for Plato. But whether it's of a form or of a particular, it must be first-hand. Plato declines to give an account of the, of the good in the Republic, and for that matter also in the Philebus. For as Plotinus once put it, if and only if you have seen it, you know what I mean. Eros is not a disease, as the Greeks often thought it was, but a kind of madness. Remember the phrase, the lunatic, the lover, and the poet. That derives from Plato's Phaedrus, and indicates love as a kind of madness, which can be well or ill-directed, being neither good nor evil in itself. We can love the good, or lust for money, or control sexual or otherwise of another human being viewed as a commodity. See the Ninth Book of the Republic, where you'll recognise also the source of my description of Platonic knowledge and reasoning as radically different from the des desiccated Cartesian alternative, though far too many professors are still very happy to confuse the two. Platonic forms are not concepts. For Plato, they exist independently of the human mind. They need to be discovered, not invented as social glue. Though they can perform the function of social glue if their political and social implications are taken seriously. To see that, let's go back once again to the distinction between the two types of politician to which I alluded when talking about Socrates and Thrasymachus. For Thrasymachus, as for Callicles and Uncle Critias and other real-world equivalents, to rule is to exploit, to seize and to hoard. For the Platonic politician, the aim is to create a society in which everybody will want to live well, base his life on moral truth. Or as Plato and Socrates would say, quote, to live in such a way as to make one's soul as good as possible, close quotes. Where the Thrasymachean society is based on selfishness, the Platonic alternative is always based on creativity. And Plato thinks that in a world where traditional ignorance which at least combined its brutality with a sense of unphilosophical that there is a real distinction between right and wrong, has long passed by, something like his metaphysical picture of the universe and the love of truth that this picture can inspire, offers the only alternative to a society which must necessarily otherwise evolve into regimented savagery and barbarism. Instead of politics, exploitation. Instead of beauty, clever trickery. Instead of truth, propaganda. And having said that, let me consider two groups of people who have seen in this vision, on the one side a way of expressing what is revealed as true, on the other what they know to be the only honest alternative to their desperate attempts to invent right and wrong. For although when Ryle said that it's odd to say that I knew the difference in right and wrong, but I forgot what it was, it's becoming easier by the day to do just that. For now, for example, Harry Frankfurt had analysed the kind of non-philosophical speech in which the categories of true and false have largely disappeared altogether. But the deceptive emotional power remains. 
It's called, as Frank Pratt says, bullshit. Yet again, I'll draw your attention to another passage of Plato, this time from the Gorgias, where in the course of some rather brutal satire, Socrates makes an extremely important point in his dialogue with a well-known public intellectual. Your art, Socrates suggests, is to teach people how to speak well, especially in public life. That's right, says Gorgias. But, says Socrates, what do you do if one of your pupils misuses what he's learnt from you, turning his rhetorical skills to some wicked purpose? You mean, replies Gorgias, if he doesn't know the difference between right and wrong? Yes, indeed, says Socrates. Oh, says Socrates, if they don't know that difference between right and wrong, I'll teach them that too. So now for our two groups, the first of which were the Christians of the early church. Two groups, that is, who learned it from this tradition. After the sack of Jerusalem in the year 70, when the modern scholar has put it, the remaining Christians were inclined to worry that there were too few Jews, too many Gentiles, and the end of the world hadn't yet arrived, the small Christian group came to realize that it would have to talk to pagan culture. And that meant developing a Christian philosophy, a Christian metaphysics, which would serve, they hoped, as a vehicle by which they could both counter the attacks of pagans who alleged, sometimes with reason, that the critics were a bunch of ignorant fideists. So they had to inspect ancient philosophical systems and gradually construct an account of themselves in which they could present a reasoned philosophical case which could win over people of the intellectual calibre of Origen or Augustine. I won't bore you with the details, but it was in various forms of Platonism which, despite their obvious weaknesses from the Christian point of view, not least because Platonists normally held the soul as immortal by nature rather than by grace, that they found what might, with gradual correction, suit their book for the following reasons. That it posited an immaterial God and an immaterial soul. That unlike the atheist Aristotle, it held strongly to the notion that God is providential. That is, he is concerned with punishing the vices and promoting and rewarding the virtues of mankind. And remember, incidentally, that in antiquity the word atheist normally denotes not somebody who denies the existence of gods, such people could be counted on the fingers of a mutilated hand, but someone who denied the existence of providence. That is what an ancient atheist is. Apart from Platonism, only Stoicism was a possibility on that score. And some Christians, like the Italian, liked the look of it. Not only because it was morally ultra-rigorous, but because with the belief that the soul is material, it might be easier to defend a crucial tenet of the ancient church, namely the resurrection of the body. An ancient intellectual, he might observe, might readily agree that the soul is immortal, but the body is a very different story. Nevertheless, the materialism or vitalism or pantheism of the Stoics eventually rendered them unacceptable, and the Platonic intelligible world, combined with the belief in Eros, which could so easily be blended into Alia with a mystic reading of the Song of Songs, the last book accepted into the Hebrew Bible, made the choice irresistible. Ancient Christians were not the only ones to discover in Platonism a respite from philosophical and theological woes. From Marsilio Ficino's resurrection of what he hoped was the academy in 15th century Florence, Ficino hoped to recover something of the joy and inspiration of philosophy which so many great thinkers of his age, not least Thomas More, held to have disappeared among the arid technicalities of latter-day scholasticism. So the love of the Platonic tradition of the Cambridge Platonists in the 17th century desperate to find an alternative to the crude voluntarism which passed as intelligent theology in their day, down to those of us today who find in Augustine's burning love for God still the most inspiring practical and Christian alternative to the triviality and banality of so much contemporary thinking. Remember that Augustine's last words were a quotation from Platanus at Enneads, the third century master, who had helped him deliver him from materialism and whom he described over exuberantly but understandably as Plato come back to life. And I have every hope that such spiritual realism will continue as long as the human race. I mentioned a second group of those who bear witness to Plato's perennial importance. Not people who think he's right this time, but those who fear he might be and recognize him as the master in moral philosophy and the metaphysics of morals who has formulated something like the most powerful challenge to their own Protagorean attempts to invent good and bad. J. L. Mackey, to take a widely read example, is compelled to admit that if there are moral realities, they must look something like platonic forms. 
He says that because he knows that Plato offers a powerful philosophical defense of the idea that goodness, beauty, and truth are not invented, but discovered. Mackey, as most other contemporary teachers of moral philosophy, is, as I've indicated, a Protagorean, someone who believes that man is the measure of all things. And Protagorean versions of modern philosophy now run so deep that its official orthodoxy to include even Kant as a constructivist. At this point, however, I have to admit that I'm very cynical about the history of philosophy in general and moral philosophy and philosophical psychology in particular. And I remember that Augustine thought, wisely in my opinion, that most mistakes in metaphysics begin below the belt. For most of us, we want to be not only Protagoreans, but also Humeans, in supposing, at least outside of the philosophy class, that reason is indeed the slave of the passions, its characteristic job being to rationalize, not to investigate. And I see much truth furthermore in the comment of Geoffrey Warnock several years ago now that, quote, if a philosopher wants to destroy the empire of his predecessors, and the best thing he can do is to get people to think about something else. There are so many examples in the history of philosophy of interesting ideas just falling out of fashion, less because they've been refuted than because we, whoever we are, just know that they are bizarre. Thus we're back to Socrates and Thrasymachus again. And though I say this without committing myself to the truth of some of the interesting ideas I have in mind, let me ask why, for example, with the coming of Russell in the early part of the 20th century, Hegel disappeared from the curriculum of most British philosophy departments, or how Hobbes got away with some of his marvelously written but outrageously under-supported claims in the philosophy of mind, claims which, when you think about them, should impel you to say, there's a thousand years of philosophy of mind gone down the tubes, and is it really quite as simple as that? Yet what's of interest is less that Hobbes said what he said, but that, quote, the wicked doctrines of Mr. Hobbes, close quotes, were taken so seriously, even by those who thought them wicked. But he got away with it in no small measure because he said what intellectuals more or less wanted to hear. But not forever. And the spirit of Plato and Platonism keeps coming back to haunt the minds of those like Mackey who think they've cured him off at last by some question-begging error theory. He will always return, that is, so long as people can still learn to think even a little bit for themselves. Finally on this question, let me give you an example of my own intellectual history. When I was an undergraduate, I studied a lot of ancient philosophy. Obviously Plato couldn't have been ignored, though he could be and was deformed. But I now think that Plotinus is the third great figure in Greek thought. Yet of him I heard not a word. So that when almost by chance I began to read him, knowing only that he was the sort of Platonist my instructors would have thought of as nothing more than a nasty little mystic, I said to myself, this guy's really good. <laughs> Though I probably said bloke rather than guy. <laughs> Why didn't someone tell me about him when I was doing ancient philosophy? And I formed some pretty uncharitable opinions about those whom I considered and do consider to have been ideologically, not philosophically driven in this matter. But I did read Plotinus in the end, and he's been a major platonic influence in my own life. So I draw near the end, and there's a sense in which the end of the beginning ought to be alike, as in the Republic. You start, you go down to the Hades at the beginning, you go down to the Hades at the end. You go down to the Piraeus at the beginning. I began with talking about how and why Plato taught philosophy. I then moved to a brief sketch of some of the more important things he taught, allowing, however, that few of his followers, Platonists though they were, succeeded in coming to grips with the whole man, and sometimes, I regret to have to say, even failing to come to grips with how he thought one could become a philosopher. Often because they were so fascinated by his metaphysics that they forgot, or never worked out, why he ever became a metaphysician in the first place. For I've tried to show that for all their differences, Plato, like Socrates, was a practical man. He didn't think of philosophy as an ivory tower activity, but as a way of making us more human, more godlike, and of inestimable benefit to our fellows, both in and out of the cave. In this respect, luckily, Plato was able to enjoy, to some extent, the support of his own society. Humanists, to use an anachronistic word, and artists in Greece, were considered not creative god substitutes, licensed to invent their own morality or lifestyle, but as craftsmen, almost as servants of society. We can see this best if we think about the poets, those educators Plato was trying to replace, but whose goals as educators were in a strong sense his goals too. In Aristophanes' comedy, The Frogs, 
the god of drama, realizing that there are no good tragedians left in Athens, goes down to the underworld to bring back Euripides. But when he gets down there, he finds Euripides challenged by Aeschylus and a contest is held to decide which of the true, the supposedly conservative or the new realist, should be brought back to earth. But before the competition begins, the rules of the art of poetry are agreed. The work of a poet, all, that is Aeschylus, Euripides and Aristophanes himself as the writer of the play, all agree that the work of a poet is, quote, to make men better in the cities, close quotes. Exactly what Plato wants to do through philosophy. So that in that sense, he has an advantage. He doesn't live in a society in which pop stars and soccer players regard themselves as moral oracles or claim that that's because they're more famous than Jesus. Plato took advantage of a social climate in this respect better than that which we now enjoy. Note that the historical Aeschylus had inscribed on his gravestone that he'd fought twice for his city. No mention of his fame as a writer of plays. But although Plato's work in the world is radically different from ours, and in some, but by no means always, superior, its moral and spiritual needs are the same. And Plato will always be there, not only telling us about metaphysics and the nature of our souls and their desire for virtue, but more immediately about how to become a philosopher, how to engage in the art by which we become less subhuman than we would otherwise be. Of course, he knows that there are corrupt philosophers. He calls them sophists, thus giving the term a bad name. And he knows that mental activity, if pursued recklessly by the half-educated, can be a very dangerous business. Someone once told me that her daughter threatened to write her, her biography under the title, Thinking Damages the Mind. But if we, hear, if we heed Plato's warnings and follow his advice, we too can learn, as many through the ages have learned, at least to begin to live philosophically. There's no better way to start learning how to do philosophy than by reading a Platonic dialogue and the next step is to read it, or another, again. Dante hailed Aristotle as the master of those who know, il maestro di color che sanno. It might look like a cheap shot, probably taking advantage of the ambiguities in the word no, but I know we wish to minimize the importance of knowledge. But I myself have learned to think of Plato as the master of those who long to understand. Thank you.